Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 80, we're going to take another look at how to achieve great sound. We're going to look at the speakers. Particularly, we're going to look at the tweeters. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, way back when I was a teenager and just a thirsting to own a real stereo, I realized early on that the speakers were going to be the hard part. I don't mean finding a speaker that could handle the power I had on tap. That was well taken care of. I had spent a small fortune on a Carver power amp that was the envy of my friends. No, I'm talking about a speaker that actually sounded good. <laughs> now, the single biggest problem, besides the lack of cash, was the tweeter. Virtually everything that was affordable sounded like total crap. So, when I started designing my own open baffle dipoles, open baffle speakers are just speakers that are a, basically a flat panel. They can have wings, but essentially imagine a big sheet of plywood <laughs> with some holes cut in it and your driver's mounted. That's an open baffle. And uh, so it's the opposite of a box speaker. And a dipole is a speaker that is allowed to play in both axes at the same time, well, in each phase. So, for example, when the speaker is on the positive phase, it's pushing sound towards you, the listener, and when it's on the negative phase, it's pushing backwards, right? Now, a dipole allows the forward sound and the rear sound and all those reflections to move around. So, a few years ago, while I was working on my my prototype speakers, I ended up building 12. I, I'm listening to number 12. <laughs> it, it took a while. Anyways, it didn't surprise me in the least when the tweeter proved to be the most difficult driver to get right. So let's take a look at some tweeters. Now, here is a lovely little standard three-quarter inch driver, about 20 millimeters. It's made by v FIFA from Denmark. These happen to be um, 8 ohms. And it's got a fair size magnet behind it. And these are just, these, these are one of those standard tweeters that were sold by probably the millions and ended up in a lot of speakers. And they're, they're pretty good sounding tweeter. They have a soft dome. Don't touch your domes. They don't like it. <laughs> but you can come close and uh, and don't vacuum them off. My goodness. I have a lovely, lovely wife and partner, um, but she insists that my speaker cones are supposed to be clean, so <laughs> she vacuums them. I should start buying spare ones now. <laughs> Anyways, here's a a tweeter that came off of a really popular um, large bookshelf speaker. I've forgotten the number now. It was the company was called BIC, and they were pretty good sounding speakers with good, decent quality drivers, and the price was just outrageously cheap. And that also has a fairly good size magnet on it. And this is a little bigger, so I think this is something like seven eighths, which would be. 22, 22 and a half millimeters, something like that. Hang on, let me go grab the biggie. I don't know if you can see it all. This is a Jensen. Let me get you, I'll get you the mouth. It's huge. I, I got to be careful I don't whack one of these soft dome tweeters. There you go. I didn't, I didn't check to see if this is a mid-range or a tweeter or even, you know, uh, mid-range right up into the tweeter but this is a big sucker and um, the uh, a horn loaded that's what this is a horn loaded 
a transducer. That's what a speaker is. There's the magnets back here in the diaphragm. We could unbolt this and you'd see a diaphragm probably similar to what we've got out here. Um, this will have a really amazing um, sensitivity. It'll be very, very high. It'll For a very little bit of power, you're going to get a lot of tweet. <laughs> Let me just put it aside before I hurt something. <laughs> So, this is what I ended up, this is actually the second version uh, of what I tried in my, um, in my open baffles. And it was recommended to me from uh, a company uh, that specializes in supplying parts for speaker builders. And maybe even manufacturers. They're, they're quite large and um, they did a f I sometimes I get stuck so I sent an email to this fellow and he's helped me out in the past with things like coupling capacitors and he sent me back a note I said my my problem is my mid-range driver is really efficient I figure it's roughly 93 dB which is pretty efficient and the tweeter I've got in place doesn't seem to be keeping up and I don't really want to drop the volume of the mid-range. I don't like sticking resistors in my crossover circuit. So I wanted something more efficient. So he said, this wave core in the wave guide uh, with a very large diaphragm, that's a 30 millimeter diaphragm, which is, I think, an inch and an eighth, inch and a bit over that, comes in four and eight ohm options, has a huge magnet structure behind it and it's 93.5 db efficient which is was just perfect absolutely perfect made for a very simple crossover the thing about tweeters is that if you don't have a something decent handling your higher frequencies let's say from about 1500 hertz up to um 20k, but really you only need it to play well up to about 10,000 cycles, 10k, because we most people can't hear beyond that, and there's very little music above that. There may be some little things floating around, especially if you're recording in a concert hall, and we want to capture those, so you want your tweeter to be able to play up to 20k. But if you have the best mid-range driver in the world, and something great for your base and you've got a really crappy uh, tweeter you've got absolutely nothing so much of what we hear as a cue in the music comes from the higher frequencies and we it's just absolutely critical that this seems or seamlessly blends into a mid-range now why am I talking about drivers well one of the things I played with for years and years and years is I would end up with a nice pair of speakers, um, a vintage set, not that old necessarily, but maybe 10 or 20 years old. And well, at my age, maybe 30 years old. <laughs> and the, the mid-range driver would be nice. The bass driver would be nice. Um, the crossover would need to be rebuilt and the tweeter would be total crap. And as a result, I ended up with a, quite a large selection of tweeters lying around from various experiments. And often, if you're on a tight budget, you can rebuild a nice, not a cheap, a, something that was really a nice speaker back in the day. You can rebuild that, re-driver some of the drivers that are not so good. <laughs> they weren't so good maybe even when they were installed. Rebuild the crossover, refinish the cabinet, and you can have a really nice speaker. on a low. That's a low budget. In a past life, I was the budget audiophile. So, and I'm, I'm still the budget audiophile, even though I have more money behind me. In fact, I have, you know, I have a business behind me to, to buy pretty much anything I want. Um, I don't want to spend that kind of money. I just I don't. And frankly, I can remember sitting in front of a $10,000 speaker, 
listening to my test tracks, and and I'm not talking about uh, ten thousand dollars for the pair. I'm talking about ten thousand dollars each, and not being impressed with the crossover from the mid range to the upper band. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I I would just rather buy some quality components and fool around than spend that kind of money on something that doesn't sound that good. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is that these are all soft dome tweeters and you can get metal dome tweeters if you like your high frequency response to be very clear, crystal clear um, and you don't mind that it can have a little bit of an edge on it. A metal dome tweeter is going to be something that you're going to love. They'll be very similar to these soft domes, but for the vast majority of us, the, a metal dome tweeter is just going to be have just too much of an edge, and it'll sound it'll be the best sounding tweeter you've ever heard in your life when you first sit down and listen to it. Give it a week, and it'll be the worst sounding tweeter you've ever listened to in your life. <laughs> That's just my opinion. I've owned metal dome tweeters and I've loved them and I've hated them. So there you go. Okay, what is going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, we've been busy filming all week long. Let me just get these safely somewhere, especially this one. It goes, I actually pulled it from my, my uh, prototype number 12s and I don't have a replacement, so it's got to go right back where it came from. Hang on. So we've been busy, busy, busy filming the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 preamp build series. And this is as far as we've gotten. We've built the boards. I'm not going to drag the boards out. I think I dragged one of them out last week or the week before. The boards are built. So the power supply boards are built. The preamp boards are built. And now we've got the the rear portion of the, of the pre fully assembled. So this is the power transformer. Here's a pair of chokes. Here's a pair of main filter capacitors. Now the reason why we have, I haven't quite fastened things down yet. Um, the reason why we've got two of each of course is this, this is a dual mono design. So basically it's two mono preamps inside one chassis. And that is that gives us an absolutely wonderful stereo image which gives us a really great sound stage. Let me just flip it over so you can see. And next up we're going to, things are going to really start kicking into gear because all this pre-work takes time. But once you start putting things, pre-assembled components on the board, wow, things go together really fast. In fact, sometime in the next couple of episodes, I'm going to start telling people about my favorite thing to do when I'm building a prototype or building any piece of audio gear. And that's what will my first track be when I fire this thing up? Not when I fire it up and test my voltages and make sure everything's operating, but when I put it in the main system and turn it on for the first time. That, I always have at least one special track in mind. Okay, what's, what's in here? Well, there's a lot of just wire waiting to be hooked up. That's all. Next week though, this thing is gonna be close to finished probably, if not finished. Okay, what came in this week? Well, hang on a second, let me just clear the decks. Now I gotta carefully get these out because these are old and fairly rare and sought after tubes. They're not the oldest Type 45, but they are getting pretty darn old. These could easily be 80 year old tubes. Now, in case you don't know, this is a direct heated triode. And normally you'll see it written DHT. And what that means is that the heater and the cathode are on the same two pins. And they're always the bigger two. Let me get it up close so you can see. So what does that leave us? Well, that leaves us an input grid on one of these things and a plate. I never remember which is which. 
And when it comes to Class A uh, magic, the number 45 is right up there with tubes like the... This is a lower powered version, let's say, of the 300B. They all have their own unique sound. The 2A3 is another one that's quite famous. But lately the 45 has been really um, driving tube sales. I have quite a few 45s. Um, and people who've been buying brand new amps, not building them, but just buying them brand new, uh, that play the 45, have been looking for some nice vintage tubes. Sylvania made some of the best sounding triodes, period. Now, you've seen me show you uh, the 6SN7s, the 6SL7s. Well, this would be like the great granddaddy of those tubes. Let's have a quick look at it. Look at the size of that waste chrome. That's, if it's in that good a shape and the pins are looking that good, that's almost certainly new old stock or very lightly used. It's got a big honk and flat black plate with three ribs. Some good structure to hold that in place. And let's look at the other one. Well, let's look at the box first. One of them came unboxed because the box had disintegrated and the other one arrived in a box that was close to being disintegrated. Now, when boxes are in this kind of shape, it's nice to know that it was in a box because I know now for sure it was new old stock. If if it had been locked in the box, and it was, it just the box wasn't holding up well. Uh, I don't send this to customers, that's embarrassing. But it's nice to get. Oh, look at that, somebody actually wrote on the box. New! <laughs> Let's take a look at the other one. And it's very similar, large amounts of healthy waste chrome, and it's, code is not an exact match. But the plates um, look like they are an exact match. So let's hope when I put them on the tester that they are a matched pair. Because nobody wants one tube. Uh, everybody needs at least two in Class A. Sometimes even four. But I have quite a few of these in stock. So if these don't match, I might have a match with another one that's in the inventory. Okay, let's carefully move these aside. As always, look at the mess I've left behind. That is embarrassing. Um, so always I leave the best to last. This box makes my heart go pitter-patter. Now, the reissue tube shares the same box and logo, I believe. It's, I mean, it's a copy. I've said other things that start with F, but maybe I shouldn't be saying that publicly. But you know what I'm saying. This is the real McCoy of all the 6SN7s I use, this is in my top three. Let's get it open and I'll show you. So this is the tall boy. It's got sort of elevated, but not that much, um, black T plates with two ribs. It's got, in this case, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got the horseshoe getter. Just coming on view there. Some of them will have a halo getter. That's a round getter. They've all got good sized chrome domes, and this one's pretty much fully intact. And the print is good. This is almost certainly, if we look at the pins, the pins are looking pretty good. It's almost certainly new old stock. Quite a few of these came in. They are rare. Uh, I can remember, oh, it was quite a few years ago, I got in, what did I get in? I got 12 of the earlier version of this, or the mil-spec version that has the mouse ears. Anyways, I put them in the store. They were in for a couple of months, and nobody bought them. And the price was very reasonable. Uh, today, people would scream if they saw the price I had them at. And all of a sudden, somebody found them, put the, must have put a note online to his friends, because they all sold instantly. <laughs> they were all, everything was gone. <laughs> anyways, um, I wish I had those tubes again today. Um, anyways, what makes these so great is the level of detail. 
Of all the 6S N7s, these probably have the best detail of them all. The detail goes back in layers of depth that just continues to recede, as though it never ends. And that is a great tube. Are they as warm and rich sounding as the Sylvanias of the period? Or any of the Sylvanias? No, they're not. They're a little clearer, um, a little, little cleaner sounding. If you're going to have great detail, you're not going to have as much second harmonic distortion as the Sylvanias have. So, everything is a trade-off in audio. Uh, if, if a great warm mid-range is your thing, you're going to love the Sylvanias or the melts, metal based tubes, if detail or a change up. I've got quite a few customers that are nuts about tubes. They're audiophiles, they take their hobby seriously, as they should, and they'll have the best Sylvanias I've got, they'll have the best tongues I've got, the best melts tubes, and depending on what they're going to play, or the amp they're going to use, or how they're feeling that day, week, or month, will depend on what they load up. Because, remember, the tubes are the amplifiers. You change out a set of tubes and you have a different amplifier. Neat, huh? And of course that's why once you start tube rolling, it's impossible to stop. <laughs> okay, well there's some of those in the store if somebody is interested. Warning, this is one of the most expensive tubes I handle. They are not cheap and goodness knows when I'll ever find new old stock again, new in the box, looking this good and testing this good. Okay, and let me, I'm going to actually put these in the box so I don't knock them off somehow. Okay, if you stay to the end, I've got some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20, and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.